The Senate has stepped up in a big way and is looking to muscle a little bit the boss of the Senate tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Great to have you in. If you've been watching all week, you know that we had the Speaker of the House on Monday, the governor last night. Tonight we have uh, Dominic Ruggiero, the Senate president. Uh, as we kind of check through the state of the state from everybody's perspective this week, thanks for tuning in. The Senate has been prominent and provocative on the Paw Sox stadium deal. And rather than getting into the entire state of the state thing right away, let's get into what they've worked on so diligently uh, right away. Last night, interestingly enough, there was yet another community meeting. The Paw Sox had, headline here talks about it, uh, at the Oaklawn uh, Grange, which is a nice old building in, in Representative Matty Ellis' district. Of course, he's the Speaker of the House. And there's all sorts of who invited who, where, and who was allowed to come where. It's kind of silly, actually. The uh, Paw Sox say that they were invited by the Speaker into the district as if, like, a passport is necessary. Uh, but they came in and uh, they made this presentation trying to turn up the district. Uh, I was there. Uh, there may be 50 people who weren't directly involved with the Paw Sox payroll. And it turned out about 12 people actually from the district lived there because I asked for a show of hands myself. And none of them say they ever were visited by the Speaker of the House as he does this walk through the district to hear that two out of three people don't like the deal. So there's all this untrackable, mysterious public response. And uh, Guy Default, a famous lobbyist and, uh, and now uh, consultant to the Paw Sox, kind of ran the show. There will probably be amendments. We expect that, and we think they will come out. But uh, hopefully they're not anything that would be a death knell for the project. You know, it's kind of a business meeting, but there's Paws and Mrs. Paws and, uh, and plenty of pizza for, for the folks there. Now, what he's talking about in terms of amendments is the work off the Senate. And we'll talk to the Senate president about that. Welcome, sir. Nice to have you aboard. Oh, thank you for having me on. You missed Paws and Mrs. <laughs> Paws last night. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I didn't get the invite. Now, well, neither did the Speaker of the House, he says. You buy that? He lives a mile down the road, and he actually reportedly asked for those guys to come into the district and talk it up a little bit. Uh, he has, let me get to your impression. Maybe you didn't see this. Monday night, uh, it made some news. The Speaker of the House more or less suggested that the Senate version was dead. The Senate bill is dead in the House, as written. The Senate bill is dead in the state of Rhode Island. Two-thirds of the Rhode Islanders do not support it, and therefore the House will not support it. Then the governor last night was saying, come on, vote on this thing. The arguments here, I think, are perfect. Your energy has been low level. You haven't moved your chips all in on this Paw Sox Stadium. Do what you? more could I do? I'm out every day something for it, among other things. Look, this is important, but it's... There's a lot other things on my plate. My team, my commerce team, spent months negotiating this deal. Hmm. Okay. And you authorized Senate uh, Finance Chairman Bill Conley to really work this thing. And after maybe a, a record number of hearings, at least traveling hearings across the state, you guys came up with the legislation. After all this hullabaloo and where we are now, what's your take? Well, first of all, I was a little taken aback by the speaker's comments uh, because, as you said, the, the uh, Senate and the Senate Finance Committee and uh, Senator Conley worked uh, for a long period of time, three months on this legislation. They had hearings across the state. It was probably one of the most transparent processes that the Senate has been involved in since I've been up in the uh, uh, General Assembly. And I just think that I was a little taken aback, as I said. And I felt that with the speaker's previous comments uh, that he was going to allow the uh, Senate to take the lead on this and that he would give this a hearing. Uh, I just felt that uh, it was kind of insulting to the Senate because of all the work that we did on this particular issue during the summer months and during the fall. And I mean, at, at, at least it's uh, very disingenuous as far as what I'm concerned because I've never experienced anything like that where a bill has gone over to either chamber and they weren't given a, a, either a fair hearing or 
uh, it was declared that the legislation was dead. So well, I'm well, a little to, concerned about that. Gotcha. To your point, I had said when he had made his remarks on my program Monday night that I can't remember in my tenure watching the General Assembly as closely as I have that leadership ever proclaimed something in receipt, either House to Senate or Senate to House, dead if they were going to have a hearing on it. Now, we all know about the winks and the nods, about going for the motions and, you know, sending it for further study or something like that. But to proclaim publicly that something en route to your house is dead uh, was unique. Yes? Uh, I, I have not experienced that in my tenure up at the State House, uh, and I think it's unique. Uh, uh, I just don't understand the rationale behind it. Uh, because I think the Senate did everything they could possibly do uh, to put together a great proposal uh, that protects the state of Rhode Island, that protects the city of Pawtucket, and that protects the team. And I think it's a perfect uh, 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 tripartite partnership bet between the three. Uh, I mean, I, I was just uh, in a state of shock when I, when I heard that initially. Have you recovered? Uh, so to speak, yes. Well, I hear that you're having dinner with him as we speak tonight, 7.30 or midnight. We're on 7.30 at midnight, so you're probably having dinner in between. True? You're having a kind of a reconciliation? Uh, we have agreed to meet tonight. Okay. Things tough between you and the speaker right now? Oh, I was hoping to have a better relationship at this point in time with the speaker. I know we had a little stumbling block going back with the budget. Uh, I was hoping our relationship would improve, but it doesn't seem to be the case. What's the genesis, or what's at the foundation, or what's the cause? Well, we have some issues now. I have a, a substantial number of vacancies in the Senate Policy Office and in the Senate uh, Fiscal Office, and um, I was hoping that uh, I could fill those vacancies, but I'm being blocked at this point in time uh, from filling those vacancies, and it's a, 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 a huge impediment uh, to the operation of the Senate right now. We are so severely shorthanded. Thus the threat of lawsuit last week, correct? Uh, we have uh, thoughts as to an avenue we could approach in the event of we don't come to an agreement as far as filling those vacancies and providing the appropriate staff uh, so the Senate can operate in its uh, normal methods. And, the, and these decisions come through the little-known entity called the JCLS, known to you but not the average everyday citizen, the Joint Committee on Legislative Services, where members of the House and the Senate convene to form the operating body, if you will, of the whole General Assembly. So you're you're suggesting, and we're moving off the paw stocks here for a second, but everything kind of seems to be in the same mix of uh, grinding discontent. Uh, you're, you're potentially going to litigate against the House Speaker to perform through the JCLS to fill these vacancies and what else? Well, I was hoping to get a meeting with the JCLS uh, because I a think... A formal get-together. That's not correct. dinner. That's a formal legislative yes, meeting. Yes, yes. Right. A formal meeting of the JCLS. Uh, there are what, five members? There are five members. There's the Speaker. There's the uh, House Majority Leader. There's the House Minority Leader. There's the Senate Minority Leader. And there's the Senate President. Okay. There's, so five, got, there's five members. So you're, you're pre-powwowing right now to try to see if you guys can get on a more even playing field and understand each other a little bit. Uh, I'm hoping that we can have a viable discussion to uh, alleviate the situation and hopefully we can move on and uh, the Senate can get cracking on what we oh, normal, okay. normally do and that's the people's uh, business. We're going to talk more about this in the next segment because okay. I think this is fascinating. Let's go back to the Paw Sox for a second. Um, what are you hearing in the hallways? Is, is the speaker, he won't tell me two things. How he evaluates this pulse of the people uh, and specifically, what kind of further investment he's going to demand from the Paw Sox. He's hinted around both, but it's not specific to, e to either. What are you hearing in the hallways in the last couple of days? Anything? Uh, what I've been hearing uh, in, probably in the past week is that some of his uh, representatives in his chamber would like to vote on this proposal. Uh, I know the Pawtucket contingent in the House has been very active as far as, far as uh, speaking with the Speaker regarding this particular issue. They feel it's very important to them. And uh, I'm hearing some support for that in the, uh, in the House side. For your version, for the Senate version? Uh, for the they, concept they of doing a deal for the stadium or the specifics of what you, what you sent over? I believe they like the proposal that we sent over, uh, whether it's changed or not during that process, during the hearing process. Uh, but up until this point, I don't think we're going to get a hearing on that. So, uh, you know, the input... Well, the Speaker says he's going to get a, give a hearing. He says he's going to give a hearing. 
which is very, uh, as we talked about, unusual. It's dead, but we'll do a hearing. Uh, it's, it's funny trying to figure out where he is because originally he was saying my members don't want to vote on this. Then he kind of rope a the referendum idea. Then he went into caucus and came out thinking, we're not doing a referendum on this, which makes sense because apples and oranges. Statewide bond would meet. We, we don't have a statewide bond here. We have the Pawtucket Redevelopment Bond. You get the mechanics. Most people don't. It doesn't match up. Uh, there are a lot of people that just say, you know, will of the people. It didn't match up. But he came out and said, that's it, no referendum. But it's dead. But we'll give it a hearing. I mean, you probably want to figuratively punch a wall right now, right, after all this work, and it's just not the way things have normally gone. Well, it has been frustrating, especially with the time that the Senate Finance Committee has put into this. I mean, forget the hearings, the, the 29 hours of hearings. It's the behind-the-scenes work, working with the, the legal counsel, uh, researching it, working with bond counsel. I mean, there was a substan substantial amount of work that went into this particular proposal. I just think it's unfair that the speaker would just look at it and say, uh, you know, it's dead, and then have a hearing on it. I mean, I don't understand why you would have a hearing on it if you're pronouncing it dead. You know, listen, I've been around, uh, you know, for a while. I, I know when I get, I'm getting my leg pulled. I, I, I sense from you authentic anger over this, that there really is a crisis of collaboration. Well, I think it's more frustration than anger, uh, because uh, as I said, what we went through intense frustration. This, I can read it right through your eyes on this. Well, it is. I mean, I'm not I'm not used to dealing in this in this manner, so it's it's a little difficult, and and I can't explain the uh, the speaker's rationale be, behind what he's saying and, and, and what he's looking to do. Uh, I know he was very enthusiastic about uh, the poor Sox when they were, they were in Providence. I don't know what happened since then. I think this is a 10 times greater deal, and I think it's a 10 times greater site. Right. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, the balance of power between the Senate and the House, because things are in flux, it seems. Stay with us. That, of course, is the Speaker of the House, and he's, the, he's not the entire subject here this evening, of course. The Senate President here, and we got to offer due respect and get his authentic and original views on some key issues. But, you know, what, what's interesting, you know, we talked about the first time that you got here, and since you've got uh, a year under your belt now, it seems like you have developed not just a hedged perspective, but a, a full perspective on elevating the Senate to a more equitable procedural position in the General Assembly. The Speaker often says that they are the financial hawks, and by the way the Constitution works, financial legislation does originate in the House. But for the most part, and you're a veteran there, but you've got to admit that you, for, with, with some variation, you've been a rubber stamp house as opposed to the place where things percolate on their own. This Paw Sox thing, I think, has given you a chance to, uh, to be something different. And it seems to me you want something elevated on a more consistent basis. Do I have that wrong? Uh, I don't know if that's the situation. What I really want is I want to have the same treatment for my colleagues in the Senate that the House gets. Uh, we're a separate co-equal Treatment means branch what, Senator? Of, what does that mean? I want to be able to work my own budget. I think the Senate deserves their own budget. Uh, as, as I said before, we operate uh, with a little less, a little less people than the House operates. Uh, Meaning you never, do you want to generate your own budget? No, I want to, I want to split the budget that the House and the Senate have for JCLS, and I want the Senate to have their own budget so we can fill our vacancies and do what we have to do in order to continue to operate. Okay. I'm not looking for any more money. That's government minutiae for most people watching. You want to... The, the JCLS budget is what? How many millions of dollars? It's 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 small comparative to it's it's tiny oh, compar compared to the, the big picture. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to get into the minutia on that, but but you want you want a more even-handed, active JCLS approach just on the rules and the procedures and the operations and the appointments and all that kind of stuff. I Correct. get I, I mean, get that I mean, part. We covered that. But when you say you want your own budget. Are you talking about operating budget, or you want the state budget to... No, 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 operating budget for the Senate. Meaning for the, Senate. the House tells you what you're going to spend, is what you're telling me. Yeah, ba and, basically. And, and you, and you want to you run your own house. 
meaning your own Senate chamber. I get it. But tell me, that, that's a big difference. Everybody needs to understand that. What the Senate president is saying is they're told what they could do, how to buy pencils and erasers and who they can hire and who they can find, because the House has control of the JCLS, the operating hub of the General Assembly. That is correct. Got you. But I think, I, I, I sense a more profound stake in the ground from you past that, that, that you want more respect from the electorate and from the General Assembly in terms of the Senate's role in making big decisions, including the state budget, yes? Well, obviously, we have a vote on the budget, so we should have some input on that because we're the ones that are ultimately, along with the House, are ultimately voting for the budget. So I think, number one, we should have a say, and we do, and things have worked out pretty well up to now. Maybe with, uh, you know, despite the glitch that we had in, in, the, um, in, in the summer of last year, uh, I just think that uh, because we vote on the budget, we deserve to have our own budget, and we deserve to make our own determination right. as to who we hire. And, and based on the glitch from last year, if you remember, there was uh, all of a sudden everything froze. And because you guys were passing paperwork, you know, shutting off this, shutting off that, didn't receive this, didn't receive that. Oh, look, it's fascinating. I actually think it's, it's good for the people of the state of Rhode Island to see both chambers, you know, fighting for the right to party a little bit. It, it, it brings diversity, even though you're all Democrats, for crying out loud. Well, not right? only that, it brings responsibility. I want to be responsible for our own budget. If I overspend my own budget, I want to be, I want to have to be held accountable for that. And I think the same thing should be said of the House. All right. When we come back, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some issues, you know, out there. And there's a little bit of turbulence in the Senate that I think is completely unnecessary. We'll talk about it next. Stay with us. All right, that uh, is Senator Nick Kettle, who, uh, you know, I think got elected when he was 12. At least he's, he's grown the beard. Oh, there, yeah, much younger. Uh, anyway, the poor, the poor guy is, is jammed up in some situation. Uh, reportedly, state police are investigating. They, I don't know, raided or came to his home and checked some electronics, and there's a dispute between he and his girlfriend, uh, former whatever. Uh, look, he hasn't been charged. Has he talked to you about what happened? Do you I, know? I have not had the opportunity to talk to Senator Kettle. He was in yesterday. I didn't get a chance to talk to him because he uh, left relatively early, uh, but I haven't had a chance we to speak to him. We see headlines like this uh, the, the, where some, there's some discontent. I think we have a headline here. Yeah, uh, he takes his seat amongst the investigation, whatever it happens to be. But then inside that story, Senator Nesselbush is talking about how uncomfortable it is because clearly it's some kind of uh, relationship issue that's at the core of this problem. And she's talking about how in the hashtag Me Too world now, there's a cloud over the Senate. Um, before I offer my quick thought on that, what is your quick thought on that? Uh, first of all, I don't know uh, the situation, the uh, Senator Kettle situation. Uh, I understand it's not related to any of his Senate activities. Uh, I understand it's some dispute he has with a either a girlfriend or a former girlfriend. That's all I know because that's all that's been reported. Uh, I, I think you always have to consider taking some action against a sitting senator who's duly elected by his constituents when there hasn't been any charges, any indictment, any arrests, or anything like that. Obviously, uh, we know there's some kind of investigation going on because they confiscated his uh, electronic equipment. But other than that, I really don't have any knowledge right, as so, to what's going so you're on. So are you going to walk into this thing and tell everybody just, you know, keep their powder dry until, until some information? Is he, look, it seems to me that Senator Nessa Bush is, is, is a little over her skis here. I mean, the guy's not charged. I, I don't know any elected officials who run to, um, let me rephrase that. I think we're all just a little bit adrenaline filled right now when it comes to men, women, and whatever's going on out there. Just because the Me Too thing is going on doesn't mean it's got any relationship to what's going on with Senator Kettle, who I have not spoken with. It just seems like overkill. And at some point, if this is going to cloud the Senate, isn't it your responsibility as the leader of it, the president of it, to stop and say, all right, kids, chill. There's no cloud. There's no charge. Let's do business. Stay tuned, right? Uh, that's my message at this point in time. You let's, want me to write that? Let's, 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 <laughs> let's, uh, I'd be happy to stop by if you want me to. <laughs> uh, sometimes my, my colleagues in the Senate don't listen to me, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, I think we should wait till the dust settles to see actually what is happening over here before we rush to judgment at this point in time. 
and I know uh, Senator Nesselbush. She is a uh, sitting judge in the municipal court in, in Pawtucket, and I know she's, uh, she adheres to, to, the, to the laws. So I think that we should just sit back and see what happens right. at this point in time and, uh, and go from there. All right, last night, uh, the governor and I had a little, uh, a little uh, negotiation, well, uh, actually a little gamble on, on the tolls. We have a piece of that? So tell me, will they be up by the time you some will be people up. vote in November Some 18? will be up. We'll some? have some up, but not all of them. I mean, they have a schedule. The uh, schedule is moving. It's, it's fluid, and it's not published formally. Yeah, we got to do one. We got to see how it goes, and then we'll move to the next one. I, I bet her that, that the tolls won't go up. And the reason I, I bet her that we're having some fun. But I, I said, I don't understand what you're doing here. The truckers have pulled back their originally public stated intent to sue based on damage for one or two gantries going up. Now they say they're going to wait for the entire system to go up. If the state of Rhode Island loses litigation when all the gantries go up, you'll be forced to make a decision to either take them all down at a $40 million money blow or pass tolls to other vehicles, meaning cars. In the middle of an election year, with everybody pounding away at her, I don't think she's going to get them up. And I think this thing is going to, I think it's a phantom exercise. What do you project? Well, I hope it's not because we're relying on the fees that we get from the trucking tolls uh, to pay for uh, reconstruction and improvements to, to our uh, highway system. 10% of roads. the entire project. I mean, I'm bullish on the road works project. It's 10% of the total funding mechanism. Why? Why are you guys hanging your hats on this toll thing, which is just going to be bad for the economy, and eventually will end up your car, my car, and everybody's car, eventually? You know that. Well, I don't think it's going to be bad for the economy. If you go on the, uh, the, the mass turnpike, uh, you pay a toll on anything that has an axle there. Uh, I think the trucks do the, the most amount of damage because of the weight that they carry and the size of those vehicles, and we're not... Uh, uh, tolling passenger vehicles in the state. So. Right. Well, listen, I, based on the way these, this litigation is going in an election year, you want in on the Narragansett bet? Because uh, she bet me, I don't know, what do we bet? A couple of beers or a case? I can't remember which. I'm telling you right here now, you'll be here, right here next year, and there won't be any more than a couple of tolls up. You want the bet? Friendly beer, coffee. Uh, See, you won't I'll take, take the bet. bet. Yeah, you won't. I'll take the yeah, bet. Well, yeah, yeah. I'll take the bet. But, but I put 50 bucks on the table, you wouldn't, because I don't <laughs> think there's a lot of confidence on this whole thing. I, 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 let me say this. Yeah, uh, quickly. From what we uh, uh, learned from their attorneys and people who, uh, <coughs> excuse me, looked sure. at this issue very closely, uh, they seem to feel that they're on solid ground. So we'll see uh, what transpires when we get them all up. It's funny how attorneys for any party will always tell their client they think they're on solid ground. As long as they're getting paid. Yeah, exactly. You got that right. It's good to see you. Come off it, will you? I, I will. Right. Thank right. you very much for inviting me. Senate Interesting stuff. Final word when we come back. Fascinatingly, state representative, gubernatorial candidate, and member of the Joint Committee on Legislative Services, Patricia Morgan, will be our guest tomorrow night as we get the Republican point of view. She has an integral role in this dispute because she sits on the JCLS, this dispute between the Senate leadership and the House leadership on the Senate being able to get its business done. She may hold all the cards in this. So the Senate president may be tuned in tomorrow night, and so too should you be. We'll see you at 3 o'clock on the radio as well on WPRO. Thank you for watching. Good night.